Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome back again to another fantastic week here at the Dank Hour. I got my hair. It was it was like perfect. Oh, there it goes again. It's perfect again. Um, as usual, I'm London, your host, dictator of dialogue, uh, master of moderation, and cultivator of conversations here with my weird and interesting compatriots here to talk about that lovely plant they all like to dig into and, and, and have a conversation about. I have a new one, the, the cultivator of conversation. I've been working on that like the whole week to get that one in there. So hopefully you all enjoy it. Um, it's like a double mo double motif there. So hopefully you all ha had fun with that one. Um, we have a lot of fun stuff coming up and coming up and moving forward. I think uh, next week, as it were, you know, I can't even look it up. I'll let you know what's coming up next week at the end of the show. Um, but we booked Kevin Jodry for an episode, so stay tuned for that one coming up. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, who else? We're working on Jorge. We're working on a lot of good stuff. But, of, of course, fun things happen. Actually, we might actually – I do remember, Dr. Mark. I remember exactly who I booked for next week, last minute, and I talked to him. And I don't know. You know, it might not happen. It's not a guarantee. But right now we got Bubble Man on the books, and we'll be talking oh, hash yeah. next week. Oh, boy. Which, yeah, Master yeah. Of moderator <laughs> has done it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll see. I mean, it's never a guarantee with with Mark. It's with, with Marcus. It's always like, a, oh no, I'll, like, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure, sure he's there. I'll, I'll I'll blow up his phone <laughs> now that I know. Okay, him. cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll get them good. It'll be awesome. <laughs> but anyways, on. as usual, I'm here with the usual crew, uh, doing the usual thing, having having a lot of fun. And we have our feature guests for the day. And I get to open up with the most boring question. Um, actually, I think it's one of the most interesting questions to get things rolling, um, but also lets us know a little bit about you. And always, I find, and I, I, I bitch about this every single time because I listen to a lot of cannabis-focused podcasts and people doing this type of thing. And, like, you always get the three, like, basic questions. Like, what? tell me about the first time you smoked weed and um, tell me what, what turned you into from a, from a consumer into an advocate. And I fucking hate both of those questions because they're everywhere. Um, so I, I don't want to know about that. Y you're, I mean, on top of a pa passionate cannabis folk um, that you are, you're a microbiologist, which is fucking cool. Um, and it has a lot of very sophisticated big words in it when you're when you're talking about what you're doing, which we're, we're going to hear all about in a little bit. But I really want to know about you. Like, what got you to where you are now? Why, why did you end up jumping into microbiology, the, the complexities and beauties of it? I mean, really, for me and what I've learned over the past few years from doing this show and having on microbiologists is it really is a driving force and the nature, the, 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 the factor of life. Like we wouldn't have plant life. We wouldn't have cellular life. We wouldn't have life as we know it without bacteria and, and our relationship with, with micro, with microbiology and everything like that. I'm not saying as beautifully as the scientists do in the room, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to just make sure things don't get weird. Or they get weird, but in just the right way. So why don't I let you take it away there, Mike? Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And first, thanks you guys so much for having me. I'm really grateful to be on the Dank Hour. Um, yeah, I think, you know, my uh, kind of going with what you're saying with, you know, everybody needs microbes. One of my favorite like theories right now is that did, uh, did multicellular life evolve because that was the right way to go? Or was it because bacteria needed a little bit more? of a specific, you know, host associated environment, like the 37C, 98.6, you know, environment in the gut, bacteria love that. Um, but yeah, anyway, my journey into microbiology, I grew up in, uh, in Maryland and was working on a farm for a little bit, uh, going to community college, not really a studious student in high school. Um, and we have a, a thing in Maryland where when you're a senior, you go to the beach called Ocean City and uh, sit there for two weeks and drink after you graduate. I went to Colorado and visited Fort Collins in 2013 and really kind of fell in love with the culture and the, the mountains, you know, cannabis had just been legalized. So it was a safe space to kind of partake in that. Um, and I transferred from community college to CSU uh, studying food crop production. And my main interests then were really kind of vertical farming and, you know, year round crop production, everything from cannabis to lettuce and beets and stuff like that. Um, but I needed a job to pay rent and pay the bills when I first moved to Colorado. So I got a job in a lab at CSU, and it was uh, it was in the center of rhizosphere biology, uh, Dr. Jorge Bonco's lab. 
So I started doing undergraduate work there, washing dishes, watering plants for grad students and stuff like that. And then uh, really got exposed to microbiology and cell culture and a little bit of sequencing data. And just kind of was, you know fell in love with the micro or the smalls as some people like to call them. Um, so I got some commercial research projects offered to me when I was an undergrad and was fortunate enough to be offered a graduate program from my advisor. Stayed there for a little bit, did uh, uh, a lot of microbiome analysis. What was my main research focus? You know, plant microbe interactions. And yeah, it's it's ruined my life in the best way. Everywhere I go, I'm always like looking at weird lichens and different systems and trying to you know bioprospect microbes and and look for. Uh, you see a, a dandelion thriving in a clogged gutter, and you're wondering what microbes are giving that root oxygen and things like that. So I'm always thinking about microbes. I try to water lichens when I'm up in the mountains and stuff. And yeah, I think it's been uh, really cool to to look at them in the sense of you know the roots kind of being the plant gut and and how those those bacteria are essential for growth and development from cannabis to palm trees. Awesome. Well, that's that's a great start. I mean, there's so many ways for that conversation to go forward. I I love the impressive abilities of bacteria and and fungi to like you know really do things that we don't think is things sensible like like break through cement and pavement <laughs> and have them pop up out of nowhere or like when when you have the like, i remember i would drive down this one road this is a little bit of a segue before we let kyle jump in with our first question but we i would drive down this road to like a local area i go see my favorite baker who is in the area talking about another my another person that loves harvesting microbes i mean very important important job but you drive in there and they had just redone this entire center meridian with all these beautiful plants and all these dandelions and flowers and then they decided to use mushroom manure and they had the what's the inky wax cat the ones that roll up afterwards you know yeah, like the caprinus the maybe, yeah. thing yeah the entire thing i'm talking two like kilometers in length i mean probably four or five feet wide middle of the road freshly done up all the grass came up all the dandelions were up everything with everything grew through and it was just like tons and tons of these these mushrooms they killed all the plants and all that was left there was one they're incredibly powerful so i'm just like somebody picked the wrong compost for yeah. that for fertilizing that before they laid down the grass my friend um but anyways i'm gonna let kyle jump in and, and take over go ahead so firstly, Mike, thanks for coming on. Secondly, I know we met briefly at the Emerald Conference. I was working at Booth, so unfortunately, we didn't get to chat a tremendous amount. Um, but that also meant because I was working at Booth, I didn't get to catch your talk at Emerald, um, which really seemed interesting to me. I got a chance to review the slides before the show today, especially knowing now a little bit more about your background in the microbiome. I've done a little bit of microbiome work myself, um, looking at more of like the surface of the plant. But I'm mm -hmm. curious to know, like from the soil perspective, like, so I guess in the work that you did looking at 16S, right, at the 16S, I, ITS, I, you know, I assume, right, ITS regions, what you're looking at there, or molecular barcode? More 16S than ITS. I'm working on those pipelines with our sequencer now, but primarily we're just doing full length bacteria. Okay, gotcha. So I guess, tell me a little bit about like the differences between different soil types and then what you find there, as well as how different cultivars kind of change that that uh, that rhizosphere and that microbiome, I guess, um, in regards to like like there, I guess that's a, there's a lot of it's a lot of questions, but I mean like how how do those different cultivars affect you know the the soil and the microbes within mm -hmm. it, and then I guess are there any differences that we see in different soil types and how they kind of adapt or change to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the project that was kind of presented on an Emerald Conference was based off of the, you know, the cannabis development and how it switches its metabolism from the vegetative stage to the transition, you know, post solstice, flower onset versus the blooming stage. Um, the plant's also changing its root exit profile, presumably. We haven't really studied that, but we've seen really different shifts in microbes um, as a result of development. So, uh, the more, more so than the differences we're looking at is the, um, the similarities between different cultivars and hopefully eventually all 13, you know, USDA plant hardiness zones, because that's a really fun way to kind of tease that environmental factor of the microbiome um, development. But what, what we're seeing is, you know, uh, lots of similar bacterial genera and species across lots of different sites where you would think, um, you know, 
the geographical regions are from like New York to Colorado and the data we're looking at so far, and we see the same genera pop up. So it's assumed from that, that there's uh, functions these bugs are performing that are necessary for the plant development. They, you know, things like nitrogen fixation and stuff like that for vegetative and phosphorus and potassium solubilization, antimicrobial compounds when the plant's kind of completing its life cycle and setting on flowers and whatnot. Um, and, you know, trying to look at the true symbiotic either communities or, or functions of those communities um, to kind of, you know, perfect an inoculant uh, for impella biosciences where I work to make, um, you know, get that biology for cannabis growers, whether they're in a controlled environment system or a soil that's like a 20 year monoculture corn plant that's inherited for cannabis now, stuff like that, trying to restore that that soil health, um, or the, at least the cannabis, you know, preferred, I personify a little bit too much for a microbiologist, but preferred microbes and the functions that they're sharing. Um, we also see, you know, like the, uh, the function seems to be more common than the bacterial species. So um, there's lots of functional redundancy in the rhizosphere in the microbiome. Um, we can see the same bacteria, the same genes for different compounds like nitrogen fixation. You know, there's a gene called NIFH that converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia or ammonium. So it's available for plant uptake. Um, and that's something that we're seeing in like a lot of the vegetative samples, whether they're from, you know, New York, Colorado, California, stuff like that. Um, yeah. So that's that's going to be recruit, uh, and yeah, we're working on that pretty pretty strongly in Impello. Gotcha. So really more lo so looking at the commonalities rather than the differences, and just seeing what kind of makes the plants tick. <laughs> yeah. So with the differences, we have all that data, and um, I think it, that'll be something to crack open soon when we get a little bit more progress on the um, the similarities, because that's what we're looking for. Those, you know, I'm going to call it the cannabis core microbiome, and then add another factor there that that's specific to development, cannabis vegetative microbiome versus the cannabis flowering microbiome. Um, but yeah, the differences are of interest as well, uh, just a little bit, um, you know, on the back burner compared to trying to find these things that cannabis presumably, you know, recruits no matter where it is growing. Gotcha. Super cool. I mean, honestly, like that's, I think it's like foundational research that we need, right, in order to really kind of well, because I mean, I, I don't, again, I, we've talked a lot with different people who work on the microbiome and the rhizosphere, and there is no ideal. So what are the commonalities? I think it makes good sense and finding that core completely makes sense. So thank you for that answer. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've got Anna. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Apparently. Hey, hey, Mike. <laughs> it's so good to have you on the show. I'm so excited. I am bummed that Tess isn't here. Uh, is she, you guys have an amazing dynamic. And, you know, we were at the Emerald Conference, too, with, with Kyle. Although Kyle was working the whole time. So, But it was a great time hanging out with you. And um, since the Emerald Conference, we have talked about microbes. And I am not a big microbe person. I don't know much about them. That's not my wheelhouse. Um so, but I used to, I had worked with a couple of people who were studying uh, tripart was it tripartite interactions where you've got the plant, you've got the microbes, and you've got the fungi. And they all work together uh, to create this symbiotic relationship. Um, and I, I want to know a little bit more about that if you if you <laughs> yeah. for cannabis specifically for cannabis specifically yeah absolutely i mean i think um the so the terms that i'm familiar with when it talks about like kind of the whole sphere of, of microbes and plant biology or is either like phytobiome or maybe the the hollow biome right the hollow biome sometimes includes the plant host and the, the phytobiome these these big jargony words um is really like the the microbiome of the above ground parts and the root zone and, and everywhere in between um yeah and i think you know the as we've learned especially with the research that dr white is doing um plants kind of co-evolved with microbes the reason they have roots is it, you know presumably because of their relationships with different microbes and in the context of cannabis there's lots of literature out there talking about you know things that are associated with the flowering tissue and the common genera that are popping up in bacteria and fungi and i think um you know, a lot of those things kind of make a really balanced community. And when those things get out of balance, you start to see, you know, bud rot, like things like detritus or alternaria or cladosporium, those things that can kind of mold the flower tissue. Um, and I think part of that comes from, you know, like 
uh, not, not directly answering your question here, but you know, over sterilization or trying to maintain a sterile cultivation system. As we know, plants want microbes, especially cannabis, because it's one of the most nutritionally, you know, needy <laughs> crops, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, so, and the microbes just kind of help the plant with that. Mm -hmm. um, right. <clears throat> we, <laughs> we, we, I mean, I guess like for the foliar parts, those, those balances are, you know, I, we talked about like how microbiomes are still like a little bit understudied in the last question and how really what we're seeing in a lot of these disciplines is whether it's the human gut or the plant root or the plant, plant parts in the aerial space, um, alpha diversity, which is just like number of different species, how many and who is there, uh, is, is associated with health. So the more species we see, the, the less chances we see for a disease because they're all kind of, you know, competing with one another and collaborating in an ecosystem that is the, the foliar part of the cannabis plant. Um, when those things can become out of, out of whack or out of balance, that allows things like opportunistic fungi, detritus, cladosporium, alternaria, just to really proliferate and then get all the resources the plant's using, yeah. So do you think that when you have, like, so let's say you have, um, you're either outdoor, I mean, that's a, a whole nother thing, but if you're indoor and you have like a shared bed and you have like an outbreak of you know powder mildew or bud rot or something in one area do you think that that is because of a deficit or an imbalance of these microbia in that particular area for whatever reason and yeah that, i think you can back yeah. that if that's the case right yeah and i think you know um, um a lot of you know you see a lot of bacillus products out there for combating powdery mildew as foliar, foliar sprays and whatnot but yeah i mean i think it's it can be strongly associated with with uh you know, over sterilization or spraying or, you know, root drenching things that are antimicrobial. Um, it's kind of like taking antibiotics for, for a person, you know, you lose a lot of the species and the diversity that are there because a lot of those guys are sensitive to, uh, to different things like peroxides and, and sulfur pots and stuff like that. Um, and that can sometimes allow the ones that are more tolerant and also pathogenic powdery mildew to just kind of pop up and, and get out of whack. So yeah, I mean, a lot of times when you see outbreaks of, of the PM, um, it's usually because there's only a few species available in the, the leaves and there's not a lot of resource competition there. Gotcha. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Oh, so then we have Evie and if I get, I'm going to get back to you because I want to learn more about this, this, this differentiating microbiome and I got a good question lined up with with the veg and, and flowering because I've never heard of this before and I think it's very interesting so I got I got to follow up there but I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jump in oh, Landon, uh, you should go for it because yeah. I was I saw your comment in the chat and was kind of thinking it kind of leads the short so I was going away does it does it lead does it lead okay if it leads I'll, I'll do it then um so I, I have a question like, so how, well, it's a two parter, right? So first of all, like, how do we know exudates are happening? How are we measuring and like pulling this stuff out for te testing? Cause I imagine it's, it's incredibly complex and challenging to like go into the dirt and pull the exudate out. Right. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. it doesn't seem like a very easy thing. And so, and, and I, and that leads into the second part of the question is are plants communicating to the bacteria and driving you know, what's present in there through their exudate systems. And, and it, do we know how that works? Is that like, do we have like, I'm going to put out this or that to, to cause these type of things? Like, do we, do we have a deeper understanding of that? From, from what I understand, we have uh, a lot of, you know, good literature out there to suggest that there's like a almost intentional feeding of, of microbes. You know, a lot of this, this research we're doing on the cannabis core microbiome that's specific to the developmental stages is, is, is kind of following a, a paper from uh, the lab I was in in graduate school from Becky Shapiro that was um, seeing Arabidopsis, that wild mustard lab rat that everybody uses and uh, collecting its root exudates. Uh, in a sterile system and as it that, that plant has a rosette stage it has a bolting stage and then a flowering stage and those flowers will make the seeds so there's a couple different developmental stages and they found that the root exodus uh, significantly changed as a result of of the development so early on in the growth the plant was exuding a lot of sugars and carbon sources which is essentially cakes and cookies for microbes that are around so it's kind of like uh speculatively like a really broad, let's just get a lot of microbes here because we're gonna pump out sugars into the soil and whatnot. Um, you throw in rhizophagy here and it, it kind of, you know, that disruptive uh, notion, which is so, so, so amazing and central in, in rhizosphere science. Um, 
but yeah, there's like a little bit of fine tuning in a black box that connects the root exhibit profile with the riser phagy that I would defer to Dr. James White for. <laughs> but the uh, anyway, the um, you know that paper showed a lot of sugars were exuded in the early stages, and as the plant was flowering and trying to make seeds and preserve its genetic offspring, uh, it 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 changed its root exits to more organic acids and amino acids and things that can be harsh to certain microbes. So it was kind of you know early on getting a lot of sugar and carbon into the rhizosphere. Uh, and then later on that, that switched to like antimicrobial compounds, you know, uh, it can be, it can be assumed that it was trying to preserve its, you know, health. So diseases can't cause and whatnot and selectively feed things that might already be colonized. All that said, um, one of the most agronomically important crops that is very, you know, photo period sensitive would be cannabis. So uh, while we haven't studied the root exodus, we have seen significantly different bacterial communities, um, even in the same soil from the same plant as the, the, the photo period changes to development. Um, so thinking there, we're just kind of looking at what the plant might be naturally causing, you know, going back to the roots in, in outdoor and even indoor systems and seeing what types of things uh, are recruited there. Um, but the, your first question about how these root exudates are collected and, and things like that, I know that uh, there's a couple techniques for doing it in living soil systems. It involves like a lot of uh, digging and root prep and you have to put these sterile tubes on the roots and collect them. And, you know, plants can reuptake their root exudates, microbes can break them down. So it's very time sensitive. Um, otherwise, though, I know that people do it in like, you know, sterile systems in a, in a laboratory setting, growing the plants in like a liquid media and hydroponics, and then they filter that out. Um, collecting the root exudates and then run that through like a like a HPLC liquid chromatography platform to kind of see what types of you know malic acid and other root exudates are are exuded there. Um, so I think it's it's most uh, most commonly studied in systems like that are sterile. And there's even been things designed. There's one called the EcoFab, which is a really awesome you know rhizosphere biologist like best friend. Uh, that is. You, you have a sterile system, you put the plant in there, and you can even add things like glass beads because it's been studied and shown that um, the root exudates change if the plant has to kind of dig through particles. So if you throw like glass beads in there, you're getting a more representative root exudate profile as if it was in living soil and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, there's, there's some people that think collecting root exudates in vitro or in sterile laboratory systems is not as representative. So there's always uh, people who are adding different soil particles or not particles, not soil, but glass beads to try to emulate like the, uh, the difficulties that root has to kind of dig through in the, in the soil system. And for those types of systems, you can intentionally inoculate microbes. So, you know, who's there and it's not just like a broad, uh, recruitment of whoever's in the soil by the plant. Cause, cause that's the biggest challenge is trying like, cause you, when you have soil, <laughs> it's a lot, <laughs> you're Water. getting a very small sample size of there's so many things going on that it's so hard to figure out what the fuck's going on half the time. Right. So it's 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 very cool. So it's like, but it's also like, how far away do you get from that that you're able to actually analyze it? But you know, I think you, you summed it up very well. I yield to to Evan. Thank you for letting me hop in there. Uh, I'm so stoked you're here, Mike, because this is like a fun shift for me because I've. Uh, my background is more in with the plant world and I actually teach soil science and microbiology, but like 101, so like I'm not mm -hmm. high level. I teach at Oaksterdam and it's um, one of my favorite classes because I feel like I get a lot of pushback from sometimes from growers and students because they're like, well, I don't really need to know about that because it's not how I grow. And I really tried to instill in students that even if you're going, it's like making experimental music, right? So it's like, you've, I love what you said about um, just, it's all the plants. And I think that people want to bypass the system that nature created to create mm. some system. And I'm like, you can't make good experimental music unless you actually know the rules. And I also want to instill in students that it's like such an early science, like that there's so much to discover and so many little things about that, like rhizosphere and the rhizomicrobiome. And it's really fascinating to me, all these little relationships. And I felt like, I think it was, because my background is like organic sustainability and uh, permaculture and all, all plants, you know, how do all these plants work together? And I, for a long time, was really fascinated by the concept that we could inoculate 
um, different microbes in order to kind of potentially steer plants to do different things that we wanted them to do. And I think that, you know, it gets very heady, especially with this group, because we can go really deep on these different directions. But ultimately, I I want to kind of talk about the more practical things, like as far as how some of this more cutting edge research can benefit people. Because for a while there were, you know, people were trying to get, especially on the hemp side, it's different on the adult use, like type one plants or type three plants. You know, if you're trying to get plants to have higher um, terpene levels or you're trying to get them to have, um, you know, more diverse uh secondary metabolites and all these things, like you're trying to create more diversity within the chemistry of the plant. And then in some directions, you're trying to go one way and other directions, you're trying to go in another. So with like hemp, you're trying to make sure that you're steering your THC levels down potentially, or, you know, how do you see these things to be practically applied for cultivators? You know, like what's the cutting edge thing that if you were cultivating right now, where would you steer people in order to make the most of this? And even if they um across the board you know i know it's going to be different for like outdoor living soil or indoor living soil but i really i see that there's a huge place and i see it with a lot of the um a lot of the nutrient companies over the past few years have really been trying to bring these things bring microbes into their feeding programs even if they're feeding with salts so i just want to kind of throw it out there and i'm like what do you see? What are the parts of that that are exciting for you about how this science can be applied in a really practical way? Excellent. Yeah, thank you for that rundown. And it's awesome that you're uh, you're teaching the young, the next generation soil microbiology. Um, I think, um, you know, I'm biased here as a microbiologist, but I, I do want to kind of bring up the term eubiosis, which is just like a, a balance. Um, you know, opposite it would be dysbiosis. That means like things are out of balance and out of whack. Eubiosis, we would call more of a balanced system, right? And I think that's the most important thing to give cultivators peace of mind. Um, I did a webinar a few years ago called There's No Such Thing as a Sterile System or the Myth of Sterile Cultivation Systems or something because, you know, as we've learned, a lot of, you know, these relationships with, with microbes are essential for plants and, and also humans. But um, I think, you know, my favorite analogy, and I, I've, I've said this before, is, is like uh, that first emergence of the root zone, the radical, first you know section of rhizosphere is like an empty dining table with a bunch of empty seeds on it um, that plant root is going to be exuding uh mostly sugars from what we've seen in early growth and development and um that would kind of feed any types of microbes that are there whether they're being applied by cultivators or just you know sloughing off the shirts of people who are, are taking care of the plants and things like that um so I like to try to add biology to my plants, whether I'm doing vegetable production or cannabis production in my own time, as soon as there's roots there, because I want to fill those seats with things that are plant benefiting. Um, I like to do that with different bacillus and, and other, you know, compost inoculants, things that you can get from, from breakdown of organic matter or even kind of foraging for indigenous microorganisms. You know, you see a, a really healthy patch of blueberries up in the mountains, you bring some of that soil back to your own garden and, and see how your plants respond. Um, Otherwise, though, the uh, I think like one some of my favorite cultivators, both in, in crop production in controlled environments and in cannabis, have been really under that eubiosis or diversity is good mindset. Um, if there's more beneficial or free living bacteria or fungi in a system that can compete with things that are negative, phytopathogens and diseases, uh, it's it's really likely that those things are not going to affect your your yield or your your cultivation strategies. We've seen fusarium in the root zone in plants up upwards of like ten to the eighth, uh, so like uh, a million cells, uh, which is definitely a, enough cells for things like fusarium to become virulent. But the rhizosphere has such high alpha diversity that we don't see plant disease. You know, we're in like week six of flowering and there's no flagging and the plants are looking good. Uh, so I, I would lean towards trying to procure a balanced microbiome. Um, that comes from different inoculants. You know, of course there's things commercially available uh, and also there's things people do in their own time like indigenous microorganism hunting, bioprospecting, making compost teas and compost additives. Um, and I also think, you know, the, the breakdown products of compost teas are really, really good. Uh, those organic inputs. I think it was on this podcast, Dr. White said something along the lines of, you know, I'd like to see salt-based fertilizers as, a, as a, a corrective fix rather than like the constant normal use and uh, always, you know, the standard, 
Um, and because they're so readily available, it's cool to, to kind of conceptualize that, although we're far away from that in any cultivation industry, uh, you know, seeing a deficiency, adding salt, correcting it in two or three days. But, um, you know, those the compost teas, there's actually some evidence to suggest that depending on the, how long you're, you're aerating them, the microbiome can become out of balance and start to consume those humic and fulvic acids and other organic materials that are released from the, the composting tea process uh, and actually compete with the plant. So there's a, a paper that came out recently talking about um, boiled compost tea in a tomato and a basil system actually did better uh, when it was autoclaved or boiled and killed of all the microbes than it was when it was applied normally. So I think, you know, it's kind of a fine tune that we're still understanding in the industry and, and just science in general on how to procure that eubiotic rhizosphere, that really balanced rhizosphere where things like pathogens might be present, but they're they're going to be fighting really hard for resources and entering that plant cell competing with things that are free living or plant benefiting. Wow, that's super cool. I really appreciate your answer just because you're reminding me like that for me, the, I just, in all my cultivation, I just feel like nobody actually feeds the forest like the forest just does it so that is just such a beautiful balanced system and so i've tried to kind of mirror my cultivation style under that that like and that's kind of what i try to instill in students too is like nobody is out there actually feeding that uh forest and i think that's a good like mindset also for even for indoor cultivators it's like you're trying to mimic that system essentially so i really appreciate your answer and i'm excited actually i I'm, I'm going to go back and read through some of your stuff because I think your well, your work is really fascinating. And I just want to say thank you for actually pushing this whole thing forward. You know, there's a few people doing it. I very appreciate thank you. thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned permaculture earlier. And one thing that's really interesting to me is like the companion planting microbiome. You hear about co-planting uh, different crops and, you know, even cannabis and like wine cap, mushroom, wine cap mushrooms and, and things like that. Um, so it's cool to see how having like, you know, two sets of roots with lots of diverse exodus in one system might uh, benefit both plants because they're, you know, procuring an environment that's unique to both of the hosts. Uh, and like you said, the forest, right? Don't fix it if it's not broken. Like, <laughs> they, they, if they haven't figured out over there, things are thriving depending on, you know, your system and whatnot. But yeah, I, uh, I love kind of the idea of going back to the roots and, and, you know, maybe not letting the plant, but persuading the plant uh, with inoculants and indigenous microorganism hunting, compost teas, to kind of procure a balanced and healthy, you know, rhizosphere microbiome. Catchphrase of the day is going back to the roots. Oh, that was very well said. Back on, yeah. <laughs> Love it, Johnny. Hey, this is a great conversation. Uh, appreciate you coming on. Um, so I guess I would like to know, um, do microbes in the rhizosphere, I'm, I'm guessing they do have an impact, you know, in the phylosphere. Um, but can you kind of describe to the extent which a healthy microbial community, um, in the root zone will have on a plant like, uh, um, above ground? Yeah. I mean, I think like, uh, as you guys know, this is an evolving field, but I think from what we've seen, there's like a lot of, uh, a lot of cool microbes that can maybe do things like inducing systemic resistance or, or upregulating different plant Im immune pathways. Um, things like the jasmonic acid pathway, allotelic acid pathway, salicylic, mavalonic, all those fun pathways that, that, you know, kind of turn into the secondary metabolites and the bioactives that we call medicine. Um, you know, different microbes have a have a influence on that. And I, I'm sorry, I don't have really names or examples of what the best thing to do for boosting up terps and, and whatnot is. But I do know that um, depending on the community, even certain stressors can can increase, uh, you know, cannabinoid profile or or uh, the terpene diversity or synthesis um, based on how the presence of them and the quorum sensing and things that the microbes are doing in the root zone that are kind of sometimes freaking the plant out, stressing it out upregulating these like microbe associated damage pathways that turn into things like, um, you know, different terpenes and cannabinoids, which in nature are, are kind of made to deter everybody but mammals and humans from the cannabis plant. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure too much about how the soil microbiome might influence the phylosphere microbiome, but I do know that like things are splashing and, and wind are a really great way to vector things. So if you know you have some type of mold, uh, in your soil, mucus, botrytis, alternaria, just throwing out genera. Um, those can kind of be, you know, 
blown up or vectored up with different insects or, or uh, weather to kind of expose some things that might not be harmful to the plant and the soil to the above ground parts. So has there been any research on uh, like pathogen, um, pathogen resistance or not resistance, but um, just a lack of susceptibility of pathogens when plants have a healthy, uh, healthy soil microbiome? I think I, there's got to be some stuff like that in the literature. I know there's a lot of uh, things in agricultural research. You know, if you Google the term on like Google Scholar or whatever, like disease suppressive soils, that kind of has to do with with um, the legacy of the soil and what plants have been grown there. Usually things that have a rotational regime have a lot more diversity and a lot more disease suppression due to their diversity uh, because of, uh, you know, presumably the root exudates from different plants that, that recruit or uh, colonize different microbes in the, in the rhizosphere. So um, in our data, we've seen uh, outdoor cannabis in Southern Colorado have really high presence of fusarium and the alpha diversity. So that the number of different bacterial species that are also in the rhizosphere, we haven't looked at the fungi yet either, seem to suppress the disease, even though according to like the literature and studies that it's definitely enough cells of fusarium oxysporum to become a pathogen and become virulent and affect the plant. So um, still an evolving field. I think uh, the general thinking now is more is better. And if, if there's more different species, whether they're you know intentionally inoculated in a, in a controlled environment or just naturally recruited by the plant via you know cover cropping, no-till, different companion planting, uh, I think just the diversity is really where we get a lot of that that stuff from. You know, I've seen the same cultivars of cannabis have a significantly different and maybe more desirable terpene profile when grown in living soil uh, compared to the same thing grown in controlled environment. So while we don't have the exact ties to all those things, it's it's presumed that you know you hear about terroir or terroir terroir. I don't know how to say that word. T e r r o i r <laughs> in wine and. Uh, it's it's the general thinking that that's both plant genotype and also the microbes that are influencing you know how the plant is defending itself, which turns into secondary bioactivities and metabolites. Um, don't have the microbe names, but I do think that the soil guys play a play a good part in in the synthesis of you know those desirable terpene profiles. I wouldn't put you on spot and ask for specific names. <laughs> <laughs> Until I wish I had them. <laughs> I'm gonna. I have one more question. You'll probably have some names for this one. Just for people who are, you know, in a sterile a sterile environment or growing in a sterile mm -hmm. environment, um, which personally, when I have, I've noticed a lot of pathogen um, pressure. Um, it's it's marketable. Um, so if people who are growing in that type of setup where it's kind of sterile. Um, what would be a couple different microbial products that you would maybe steer them to um, just to, you know, get their, you know, dip their toes in them and use in microbial products? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, I, I got to plug Continuum from Impello is a, is a bacillus consortium. It's co-cultured, so there's beneficial metabolites in there too. But I think like um, bacillus is a really great bug, whether or not it's from Impello, um, like if, if it's in the rhizosphere. We've seen really cool stuff like people are adding hydrogen peroxide, uh, ozone, different ozonators and uh, other free radicals to their liquids, you know, the, the nutrient solution. And we're still seeing proliferation of the bacillus in the rhizosphere. So one thing that people, I think, sometimes forget with, with sterile systems or trying to make a sterile system um, is that that rhizosphere is a really, really awesome buffered microclimate that kind of, you know, will select and maintain um, Again, personification will be the death of me, but like the, the bugs that the plant wants there. Um, bacillus, for example, is really resilient because it's an endospore former. So it can be tolerant to things like extreme heat changes and salt content changes. Uh, and it also uh, will kind of maintain its presence in the rhizosphere even after a sterilization event. You know, we do see some reductions in the cell numbers uh, after something like peroxide is added to a system just as like a cleanse or cleaner. Uh, but those, those bacteria every 20 minutes of bacillus subtilis divide. So those populations are pretty quickly maintained. And I also recommend, you know, if you do need to use sterilizing agents or cleaners um, and you are a fan of biologicals, reapply them within 12, 48 hours, 24 hours after the sterilizer is there because your plants, you know, it's, it's kind of like putting antibiotics all through the root zone. There's going to be some things that are resilient and hide in those nooks and crannies of the rhizosphere that can stay up. It's like what our appendix does uh, in the gut. 
Uh, but as we've you know talked about a bunch, the plants want the microbes. They're doing functions for them that that make their lives and their energy expenditure easier. So I think reapplying biologicals, if you are going to apply cleaners, is a is a great way to kind of maintain that balance of pathogen levels down, but plant desirables up. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Next up, we have Dr. Mark. Hey, Mike. How are you? Nice to meet you. Um, Likewise. So let's see. You you mentioned a lot. Of, I'm I'm batting cleanup here, so I get the luxury of listening to you in the previous question. So I, I get to uh, think about uh, long and hard about this question. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned microbes. You mentioned plants. You mentioned fungi. <laughs> They're so diverse; they have their own fucking kingdom. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're more related to us than plants too. It's crazy. <laughs> it's it's just amazing. Fungi are just amazing. And you 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 said quorum sense. I I'm, I'm a chemist by training, so I'm always interested in the chemical aspects of what Mother Nature does in her chemistry set. And what I can tell you is that, you know, nitrogen fixation is is a very um, energy intensive reaction. You know, if you're trying to do this by like the old Haber process, I mean, it's like several hundred kilojoules per mole activation energy. So it's yeah. just requires like middle of the sun kind of chemistry to happen. And in fact, I mean, it was the invention by Fritz Haber, the Haber process itself which was the basically the hydrogenation of ammonia or the hydrogenation of nitrogen to make ammonia, which created all of these soluble nitrogen-based fertilizers, right? Because the infinite source of nitrogen that's free is basically nitrogen in the air. And, you know, as, as, as a chemist, I mean, we use actually nitrogen as an inert atmosphere to conduct chemical reactions you know we'll flush the flush the vessel out because we don't want any oxygen in there or any moisture so sometimes we'll we'll blanket the reaction with nitrogen because it's so inert so whenever i i, I hear people like yourself talk about nitrogen fixation i i go right to the chemistry and say my god those microbes right i mean this is our primordial cousins right who who figured this shit well, out eons ago right? how to take nitrogen from the air and again this is a reaction that if you're trying to do in a in a vessel requires incredible heat and energy and pressure to force because nitrogen is just so happy it's it's just it's n2 it doesn't want to react right it's pretty inert right. but under the right conditions so so these, these um these uh these these bugs and again, where I'm fascinated, I'm fascinating in the chemistry that's going on down there, you know, and the more I hear from people like you, the more I'm convinced that I'm not such an amateur at soil chemistry, that there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot down there. We just don't know what's going on. We know that, again, having a rich soil, like a living soil, you were saying, ends up growing really gassy cannabis the, the the terpene levels on cannabis grown in living soils it's almost like unfair compared to right. you know trying to reproduce that in rock wool with mm -hmm. soluble ammonium derivatives right it's just you know forget about it mother nature's been at this a lot longer than we are you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> going with living soil is kind of like well let's use mother nature's chemistry so i guess my question is is um I asked a, a speaker a couple of weeks ago about this. We were talking. And so I had a friend who was studying these things called nod factors. Are you familiar with nod factors? Yes. Yeah. So like the rhizobium genus and how they induce the nodules in the legume plants. So yeah. So those, yeah. so, so those are actually activated. Those are that the, from what I under, I, I don't know a lot about this area, but I, I know that they're actually activated by flavonoids. So there's actually flavonoids in the soil that's emitted by the plant that then causes this these bacteria 
to make these polysaccharide molecules. And if you look at these molecules, they're really cool because they're polysaccharide. So it's like a ring of, you know, a, a, a yeah. plate of sugars with a long fatty acid at the end, right? And so as a chemist, I think, oh, you know, what the hell? Why do they make that molecule? Why are they? So, I mean, as it turns out, again, there's a whole bunch of soil bacteria chemistry going on down there that we don't even, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. I mean, things like this. So my question to you is, okay, so we know about things like nod factors. And again, that speaks to this chemical language that exists between the microbes. And there's more, probably more microbes in the soil than there are, say, like fungi. But but needless to say, like what we found when I was studying uh, a wood, uh, yeah, I studied wood for a while. Um, we found out that the way wood rots is it doesn't, rot by fungal invasion it's bacterial invasion first mm. these bacteria are like the most primitive of all bacteria they exude these cellulases that just start chopping up cellulose and holocellulose and it rings the dinner bell for the this whole zoo of fungi to come in on its heels right to basically start degrading and 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 so there's this there's this language of chemistry that's between the microbes and the fungi and the plant. And we really, we really don't really know at all. Or we, we, I mean, like, like nod factors is like one clue. So that's like one strain of plant. Right. I think they're really important with um, le legumes and beans and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, is there kind of like a nod factor kind of molecule for cannabis? So if you think about it, the interaction that's between these bacteria and the rhizosome and, and the fungi and the soil. And re remember that uh, can cannabinoids are made by enzymes. Terpenes mm -hmm. are made by enzymes. What are enzymes? Enzymes are proteins. What are proteins? Proteins are these huge, long chains of amino acids. Amine, they need nitrogen. They need soluble nitrogen, right? So anything that increases soluble nitrogen is just going to increase vigor within the plant because obviously the plant needs these enzymes to produce these secondary metabolites that we're all interested in harvesting. Right. But so I, I guess, again, just to go back to my question, my question is when you think about like the nod factor system, mm -hmm. you have bacteria exuding chemicals that are stimulated by a plant that's exuding chemicals. It's like, okay, so those are like this chemical communication. Is, is there stuff that's specific to cannabis that we know about it? Or it seems like it would be a ripe area to study. Are there nod factors in cannabis or nod factor like molecules that are stimulated maybe by cannabinoids, maybe by flavonoids? You know, all the cannabinoid biosynthesis has happened in the upper part of the canopy. It's not down in the root zone, but there, there are some cannabinoid-like molecules down in the root zone and nitrogen-containing cannabinoids and other compounds. So are, are, are there other chemical clues that we could kind of pick up from all the studies that have been done on cannabis to try to understand what type of chemical communications happening down there? Yeah, yeah, that's an awesome question. And I think, thank you for giving me a quick little rundown and some more uh, plant molecular chemistry and bacterial <laughs> you know, metabolomic crosstalk. I, uh, been a little bit, you know, I had to dust off that part of my brain. Um, but I think, you know, the nod factors, those from what we know are, are pretty specific to the leguminaceae family, the beans and lupins and, and other plants like that, um, to induce that, you know, hormone change in the root where it makes a great little beautiful bacterial house where things like right. rhizobium and nodule. mesorhizobium colonize. Yeah, the nodule. Right. Um, That's why they're called nod factors. I bet. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, to induce the nodulation. Yeah. They make nodules. Uh, and, and it's crazy. If you cut one of those open, it exudes kind of like a pink exudate depending on the plant. And it's like the bacteria, you know, you can almost taste the nitrogen when they're, <laughs> it's like a, a sweet potato. If you cut it fresh, it's just kind of pumping out different bacterial um, exudates. The, um, for cannabis specifically, you know, we, we haven't really seen things like symbiotic nitrogen fixers or things that kind of make that nodulation in there, but there are species, um, I think Bacillus pumilus is one, Azospirillum brassilens, Pantoia dispersa. These guys are able to uh, colonize the root zone and then access, you know, as long as the soil is nice and aerated and not too compacted, 
the nitrogen in the atmosphere, and then they produce a gene called NIFH, which kind of goes into that N2, um, NO2, you know, the nitrogen in the air molecule, and it, it's an enzyme that breaks that down, and the end product is NH3, uh, which can be a great way to, you know, not only diversify sources of nitrogen for the plants and the microbiome, you know, add some some ammonia or NH3 it's to a, it's your nitrogen. high salt. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a whole clay, like clade of bacterial genes that produce nitrogenases. Um, I know there's like NIFH and NIFB, and I use that like keg database a lot for those pathway conversions. Um, but yeah, it is a nitrogenase enzyme. It does break down and convert the atmospheric nitrogen into NH3. So we are finding bugs, uh, you know, because that relationship seems to be so symbiotic to the legumes with those rhizobium making that nodulation. Uh, the other route would be to find bacteria that have similar functions, but don't require that little housing structure that is, you know, kind of so essential from the rhizobium um, in the plant roots. Uh, Impeller actually just put a product called Neuro on the market that is a, a Nasospirillum brassilens and a Pantoia dispersa, uh, two species that they are nitrogen fixing. And we've done studies where uh, we have like 100%, you know, like J.R. Peter salts in a hydroponic system and the plants with the Neuro are showing even higher nitrogen content in the foliar tissue compared to the ones that aren't. And, you know, obviously you want to wean that off when you get closer to flower, but um, having those two microbes in your root zone in the early stages in bed when nitrogen is so essential can also kind of contribute to that balance or really diverse rhizosphere as you move to the flowering microbiome. Um, but yeah, I guess basically like those genes, those NIFH and the nitrogenases in, in those non-nodulating bacteria, different species have been shown to kind of turn them off when nitrogen is readily available. And it was really cool that we were able to see them still firing and functioning, you know, or presumably by the way the plant was uptaking nitrogen when nitrogen was like hundred percent available in the form of a salt. Do you know if there's issues like with nitrogen deficient soil, not nitrogen, uh, iron deficient soils. And, and the reason why I asked specifically about iron is because the, um, the nitrogenase enzymes, the way they work is they have an iron uh, atom at the active site of the core of the enzyme and somehow like the nitrogen molecule like coordinates to that and then the iron does like fenton chemistry and it goes from iron two to iron three right and then it's it's able to basically reduce it to diimid and then ultra ultimately to 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 ammonia so i'm wondering if you have um nitrogen deficient soil um, I'm not nitrogen. I keep iron, saying that. Right? I, I meant iron. That's what I meant. Iron in an iron deficient environment. Um, do, does nitrogen fixation slow down, or or it can 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 you retard it? Or that's something that I, I haven't actually looked into, but that's really interesting. And I, I got my little my little notebook here <laughs> for after the show. Or but or, or <laughs> I, I guess uh, can can you push your your finger on the gas pedal there and supplement it? So if you add if you add iron to your to your nutrients or your soup, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's certainly there's lots of natural sources of iron. You don't need to use synthetic iron or right. you know you know Chelators, just, stuff you like just that. rust <laughs> rust <laughs> yeah. I, 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 Fe two O three rust never sleeps right. That's what Neil Young said. So um, yeah, I mean just Fe two O three because there's a lot of Fenton chemistry. The Fenton chemistry is is the chemistry of iron two to iron three and how that can basically propagate a hydroxyl radical, which starts doing all kinds of radical chemistry. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, instances in biology where hydroxyl radical is formed and helper T cells in the body it's formed. And right. uh, these uh, cellulose uh, um, or these pseudomonad bacteria that exude cellulases yeah, if you put an iron chelator in there, it shuts down the Fenton chemistry, and guess what? Mm -hmm. They all die. So what we found is really good iron chelators would basically, you know, mess up that chemistry. But we were trying to preserve the wood, you know, for like picnic <laughs> yeah. tables and jungle gyms and stuff like that. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Guys, yeah, get your head out of the gutter. We're not talking about ED medication here. <laughs> wood preservatives, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, well, I wonder how much interplay like the, the siderophores, you know, the iron uptake uh, enzymes that are produced by bacteria uh, kind of interplay with the nitrogenase uh, enzyme, uh, you know, synthesis I, and stuff like that. You would think just because understanding the chemistry and how these nitrogenases work, that if you tie up that 
that iron, those, yeah, enzymes are going to be shut down. What we know in, 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 in medicinal chemistry is there's um, families of enzymes called uh, matrix metalloproteinases, and those are also metal centered. They typically have a zinc in the, in the, in the center. They can't have an iron too, but we find that hydroxamic acids, which are very potent metal chelators, basically right. chelate to the metal and just shut that chemistry at the enzyme active site down. Well, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would speculate and say that if iron wasn't available or it couldn't be produced from a neighboring, you know, keystone species that can do like the sidereophore stuff that, that, that nitrogen nitrogenase synthesis would be limited, but that's something I'm actually interested in looking into. So thank you. I guess it depends if you live in the rust belt. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Much like urban runoff, your soils get right. Like <laughs> that's why we do the show. Up next, Kat. <laughs> All right. So I asked Colin Bell this question too, and I think a lot of microbiologists or people who are familiar with cannabis cultivation might be, or just in general, people who like study the type of stuff that you study might look at this and go like, hmm. There's no real good answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because yeah, I, I just think it's an interesting question to think about. If you sure. had to pick one, only one so like um, microbe that you were going to inoculate the soil with, and you had to only pick one, which one would it be in terms of benefiting overall plant health and why? Man. <laughs> I told you, it's not an easy one, because yeah. there's so many facets. And as Colin explained to me, he's like, yeah, well, it's like you kind of need different things at different times. So is there right, one right. kind of a generalist that, like, I guess fits uh, all of those things? Or does, I mean, I know they all do different jobs, but is there one right. that is, like, the best generalist out there? So I, I'm a super biased person into bacillus. Um, as we know, you know, bacillus subtilis is a super uh, robust microbe. It's been found in the space station. It can make an endospore. It can proliferate and help with plant growth promoting functions. It has passive antifungal functions. So that could be beneficial for kind of fighting off, you know, different uh, fungal pathogens that might be in a system. I, uh, I like to answer your question. And this is not the right way to by saying like, I'm, I would find a plant in the woods and collect that soil and then just dump that root soil into there. That'd be my one micro, but that's really like one microbiome as opposed to <laughs> one species of a micro. Yeah. Um, soil slurries could be a really fun way to, you know, you see something growing really well and uh, you, you apply it to a different crop species and, you know, add a stress or something and see if the resilience from the microbiome in that root zone. Uh, might help a new plant with a different stress or, uh, you know, there's a paper that shows they collected the roots of a bunch of tomato plants that flowered like two weeks earlier than the rest of the ones in the block, same seed type, same cultivar, same greenhouse. Um, and then they applied those to a second generation and every tomato plant flowered earlier than the control. So it, it's really cool to think about, you know, how, how these bugs can, can play a strong role in plant development. I'm also going to go on a quick tangent and say, the wild types species of cannabis are something I'm really interested in. You know, we've, we've demonstrated like the, just the science community has demonstrated in potato that when potatoes have been very spoiled and grown uh, by humans with all the nutrient requirements and things that, you know, they don't have to stress their bodies out to, to you know, expend energy and get things like phosphorus. They've actually lost the gene um, for recruiting different bacteria like enterobacters and things that can solubilize phosphorus because they're so used to having it just readily delivered in a salt farm by humans. And I, again, personification, but, you know, this readily available nutrient kind of influenced the evolution of a potato plant to lose its, its genes um, to recruit those things that are necessary for it to, you know, get enough phosphorus to make flowers and seeds and stuff like that. So like, you know, ruderalis and other wild type cannabis, uh, I think those microbes in living soils, especially close to their center of origin, are are going to be after, uh, or are going to be, you know, evidence to suggest maybe that one microbe that is popping up in a lot of cannabis cultivation, um, whether it's the wild types or the super domestic 30% THC producers. If we see something similar there, then, uh, you know, I would change my answer to that microbe for cannabis. But if I had to just kind of at face value, any crop, full cycle, one inoculant, it would be a bacillus Well, it kind of brings back full circle to uh, like cut some of the work you did. Like, what is that one commonality, right? What is that one commonality? And then picking that top, you know, the top, well, let's most compos uh, highest composition, right? I think that makes right. sense. So here, here's, that was a great answer. Thank you. I'd be dying to get my hands on some some dirt. I like to say dirt over soil. Uh, it's not the right way, though. <laughs> if, you know, <laughs> if anybody knows any, you know, wild type cannabis cultivators around the world, that'd be, that'd be a super sweet microbiome to, to check oh, yeah. out. Audience, uh, Mike's got a request. Do you hear that? <laughs> that's, that's a call out, people. You, 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 so 
So you shoot me a message right now. We actually have, and I should take this opportunity to mention, we have an official Dank Hour um, Instagram page, the underscore Dank Hour. Um, you can find it in the description there. So make sure to go over there. And if you have some wild type cannabis and you got some soil you want to send them, um, we'll, we will make sure that happens. Okay. So don't forget. And if you don't want to, if you, if you don't want to send soil, that's fine. Still check out the Dan Cower Instagram. Yeah. Check it out. Any merch yeah. Coming, so. Right. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, also, you know, Keep soil to yourself and, and check it out too, and you know put it out there for the good of good of cannabis cultivators everywhere. I love this you know, kind of open source science. We can do that. No, we're gonna get as many people as possible to just straight up send you dirt. Just, just, just straight up, you're gonna get bags of dirt all day fucking long. No labeling, no labeling. Being a happy, yeah, no labels, no. <laughs> From who uh, knows where. Completely shameless plug because this is the day power and we can plug ourselves. That's all right. I'm cool with that. Um, I love that answer. Cannabis has been coddled by us for tens of thousands of years. And uh, during my PhD, like defense, somebody asked me like, what, you know, function do terpenes and cannabinoids play with the plant? I'm like, we you'd like we we can guess but like we have chosen everything that we see in this plant it is all for us this plant has hardly had a chance to even figure out what it wants for itself right so i love that i love that answer um and kyle stole one of my questions which was what what is your favorite microbe and why so we can skip over that real quick so i'm going to go <laughs> straight to the next really Simple question after we've been through a whole bunch of really technical stuff and say for the home gardeners, um, what are your practical tips for nurturing a healthy soil biome, whether it be one plant or, you know, a backyard? Like, what do you got for us? Yeah, absolutely. I do want to geek out about the psilocytilis one more time since that was your question as well. <laughs> um, I, you guys... My, uh, this is, you know, I think it won an award of this, like bacteria of the year in 2023. Um, there were these German researchers that engineered a, a type of concrete uh, and the bacterium was uh, able to exude calcium carbonate. So it was essentially like a self-healing concrete. So when a, when the ground swells and cracks, the concrete will crack because of just the foundation. Uh, you add a little bit of water, that bacteria wakes up, exudes calcium carbonate and the concretes become self-healing. I, uh, I haven't looked into it since like it was first, you know, like seminal and a really cool LinkedIn post that was going around, but I thought that was, um, you know, so many structural things are, are happening in, in older buildings, especially in you know, really clay soils. So trying to have, you know, a, a biological approach to, to keeping us in our boxes that are our comfort zones is, is a really cool thing that the psilocytilis might be able to help out with. Um, That's but, your favorite. Yeah. And, 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 and the why is because of that uh because of a lot of things it does and I, I would say maybe not my favorite but i think it's at the forefront of my brain right now you know we do a lot of bacillus work there yeah so it's like that lowest thing if i really wanted to think about it you know <laughs> there's a bacterium in your gut that is like a recycler of the mucosa that lives in your gut and that basically like just is a freshens up all of the the digestion properties which is really cool but that's not relevant for plants but one depends on the system you know? right yeah. There's at least one that eats plastic now that we found or something. Yeah, some fungi that can break down plastic. Uh, you got the, I think like the, I think maybe some Stamets research he was involved in uh, uh, of taking uh, radioactive soil contaminants and, and, you know, accumulating them in the fungal body and whatnot. So I'm super biased to mushrooms, but yeah, I think Kyle's question, you know, one inoculant for the production would be a subtilis. And then your question about, you know, what the home grower can do. Um, some things I really like to do in my own garden or leave my plant skeletons in the, the dirt, in the soil, all the way through the winter. Uh, those root zones and dead plant parts, as you guys know, are not only really awesome houses for pollinators and beneficial insects, but the roots in the soil can, can be really good overwintering structures for some of the beneficial microbes that might be resulting from you know, your own practices or things you're applying. Um, so it's a good way to kind of preserve the microbes. Um, if you're not going to like just, you know, collect them and sequence them and culture them and all that stuff, you can just leave your roots in the soil. Uh, it kind of goes in the, the theme of no-till. Um, and it depends on your scale and your production. I know those things aren't feasible for, you know, really high production systems. But backyard gardening, a huge advocate for no-till because those microbes stay there. Uh, crop rotation, 
So every plant, you know, most plants have different root aggregate profiles. Uh, the general thinking is those are food sources, cakes and cookies for different microbes, cakes and cookies to quote Elaine Ingham from the Soil Food Web Institute. Um, those guys are going to be, you know, you hear about permaculture and companion planting that really can help sometimes when the root exudates are colonizing, you know, mutually beneficial microbes. And that's a newly growing field in microbiome research. Uh, other than that, I, I love, you know, composting. I, uh, you know, I'm a renter where I live at my house and having a compost pile is like a condition for me to sign a new lease as long as that's okay. Cause I want to kind of keep those things broken down in my house and have my veggie scraps turn into plant food in the, the springtime. So a huge advocate for composting. Um, I know that the, uh, you know, you hear about indigenous microorganism hunting and those, that type of bioprospecting. Um, I can't remember the last name, but a gentleman named Marco, you guys, I, I think I've talked to him, uh, have, you know, will go foraging essentially for microbes, seeing a really healthy plant or stand of plants in the forest or in a desert adding some microbe food. I think they use like starches and rice cakes and stuff, leaving that for a week, coming back, applying that to a system. And I think, you know, there was anecdata, anecdote data uh, of like desert soil, uh, really, you know, not watering this bed as often as you need to when those microbes were, were applied there and stuff like that. So I think I strongly, you know, I, I have huge, I'm a forager. I like to find like plants and mushrooms in the woods and make medicine and stuff and, and topicals and, and extracts and all that good stuff. Um, and I also think foraging for microbes is something that we all should, you know, be a, have on the radar when you're kind of hiking around the woods or anything like that. I love it. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, that was a fun one. Next up, we have Evian to the floor. Oh, cool. Yeah, right. Sorry. I've I've been fighting off a cold, so forgive me. I've been so busy and I've been fighting off a cold, so I'm kind of spacey today. Uh, but I just, I have a few questions, but I'll try to bring it to one question because I actually was, I'm super duper curious about three different things and I'll just kind of put them out there in different contexts. A, I'm really fascinated with where you guys are going to go with the zone work, like in the next phase. That was something that really stood out to me because I haven't heard of anybody actually correlating the rhizosphere, the rhizo microbiome with the actual zones. And that to me is incredibly fascinating work, especially like, and you're talking about the wild, um, the wild cannabis that's out there. Cause I've also been interested in that myself, just how, how these things are so different. And when you see some of the most successful plants you've ever seen growing in the compost pile, you can't unsee that, you know, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, interesting the way this plant kind of moves culturally and then what's happening. But the other two parts that I'm very curious about is how this work with biocontrols, because I went on a long period of my life, I was deeply obsessed by biocontrols. I'm still, mm -hmm. you know, fascinated by biocontrols and how, um, I think in the future, like the future of agriculture is really protected. We really do need to work with these things environmentally, whether you're indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, whatever sort of cultivation. I believe that biocontrols are one of our best allies as an industry because this has become large scale horticulture. You know, this isn't it's actual agriculture now and we need to start thinking in that way. So I'm really fascinated by how we can utilize some of this information to help us as we evolve yeah. with that and then the other part of you know i'm just putting it all out there because my brain is not yeah, i don't have an off button apparently um but <laughs> the the other part i'm really fascinated by is that just that you have a love of um you know the rhizosphere and microbes and then also cannabis but the other plants and i just can't help but kind of also be like what other plant what other parts are fascinating what are the most exciting parts of all of these things for you you know where, where, where what lights you up beyond the cannabis place or where are you most excited for this research like the direction it's all going like what's what, what about all of those things kind of lights you up is kind of where i was curious yeah yeah absolutely um i think you know one thing i'm, I'm really excited about is is you know how the microbiome or even different defense compounds apply to the plant on the outside of the body, rather than them being you know chewed by a caterpillar and producing them inside, um, alters like the secondary metabolite profile of of different cramp, uh, plants, crops. I said cramps, <laughs> uh, and you know just basically what we can do for for medicinal compounds. I think you know a lot of things that we have in in bioactive pharmacology are 
hey, we have this E. coli bacteria. We put a gene in it to make this, you know, insulin or some type of, of medicinal compound. Um, and that's amazing because the production is super fast, as fast as bacteria can grow. Uh, I'm also really interested in, in, you know, going back to the plants where we've discovered these compounds and working with them um, and their microbes on how they could, you know, maybe upregulate the production of, of bioactives like secondary metabolites without jeopardizing yield and without jeopardizing plant health. You know, the general thinking is like capsaicin and chili peppers is, is synthesized to just deter, you know, herbivores and other things from spicy stuff. If, if they have, you know, an ability to, to feel that capsaicin heat, um, we as humans like, you know, to torture ourselves, so we breed the hottest peppers and eat them and stuff. And I think that there's a, a really cool component there. Um, that maybe is is more you know thrown into the labs and in the bioreactors and in the E. coli you know drug production, uh, but trying to you know if one plant produces let's say basil makes osamine at like ten parts per million, if we can increase that to like three hundred parts per million in the same plant um, just from microbes or applying different defense compounds, uh, that is three times the fold of an extract when when you're extracting something like that. So I, I would I would love to see um, you know more research in that space. As far as it goes with the, the cannabis core microbiome, um, I think it would just be really cool to kind of you know, work with nature as we've talked about and see what types of bacteria or at least the functions and fun fungal functions are important to us too, um, are essential or you know speculatively essential because they're happening in seven different cultivars and 10 USDA zones and four different stages and, and stuff like that. <clears throat> and, and trying to provide that because there's such a shift for indoor cultivation, especially in cannabis, um, to try to get those things, you know, uh, we hear hard to culture microbes, things that need like an emulated plant root or like a really specific environment. And, and that's more of a challenge, like uncultural bacteria. I think, you know, there's a, there's a host and there's a co-evolution where these bacteria live for a reason. So if we, you know, need to emulate a plant root in a bioreactor to try to provide these products to, to cultivators, um, that's what we'll do. Uh, and, and learning from nature by trying to, you know, see what is being associated, um, you know, in as many different environments as possible. That could be a really fun one. And, you know, also we, we have some defense compounds and, and uh, biofungicides in the research pipeline at Impello. Um, one would be methyl dihydrogasmonate. And, and that is another example of applying a defense compound to the foliar parts or the root parts of the plant. And it's altering its metabolism uh, in such a way to produce more secondary metabolite. And we've even seen shifts in microbiomes uh, just from applying a defense compound to the plant. And it's a compound that the plant would produce naturally under different herbivory or uh, uh, attacks or mechanical damage, um, but it would, by applying it, you know, to the outside of the plant, you're saving that energy expenditure that the plant would use by making that compound to tell its neighbors and tell itself to, you know, become more bitter or make more this or that, um, make more secondary metabolites that are, you know, people medicine, um, and still maintaining the the yield of the plant because it's not jeopardizing its its biomass synthesis from from you know changing the metabolism to make a bunch of defense come out. We're, we're just applying it exogenously. Uh, yeah, so the secondary metabolites are, are really interesting to me. Uh, the word I can't say, terroir, terroir, uh, is also something that is super interesting um, and how the microbiome and the interplay and that metabolomic crosstalk in the root zone all kind of play a role in making desirable wines and, and you know cannabis profiles for consumers and medicine. That's really cool. I was actually going to ask you about the jasmine. was going to be my first question because I've been kind of fascinated for a long time with like how we can actually apply some of the things that the plant already, that's a whole separate thing, but I was really fascinated because I did see that in some of the things when I was reading over kind of your background, I was like, oh, I've been interested in that for a while. And, and some of those other, I have some other theories about that in the biocontrol world, like how potentially right. can utilize similar things to jasmine to bring forth what the plant would already naturally, you know, um, especially with the, my brain is not working hundred percent today, but the, um, with uh, the pheromone kind of thing with the other, with insects and other things, I've been really interested in that. So I was pretty stoked to see that you guys are putting forth work in that. Jasmine is pretty fascinating on that, like the hormones and how it works with the bugs and the plants and all the things. So very cool. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Now it is getting late and this has been a fantastic conversation.
I have really enjoyed it. Do do we have? I think we could squeeze in one more final question. Does anybody want? Is anybody like hopping at the bit to to get one more question in, or or do we do we round it out for a fun evening and call it there? I don't see any hands being raised. Um, so I will say it's been a fantastic evening, and 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 I've really enjoyed the the conversation. You've had, like you, you started off with a banger with with talking about how we have different how there are highly different bacterial groups and colonies for flowering and vegetative stage that just right off the bat you you got you got me hooked on the conversation knowing that um these things are different like i i no idea i'm just like just throw shit at it let's 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 hopefully things work out as the home grower guy right um so Thank you for being here and thank you for spreading the knowledge and, and putting everything forward that, that we have. My question for you is, and we like to do this at the end of each episode, is how can we support you? Like, thank you for coming in. You, you, you've taken an hour and uh, an hour plus of your time out of your day to, to spread knowledge and, and spread, you know, as much information as you can and, and bat it up against my beautiful panel of, of insanely smart people um, with, with horribly challenging questions half the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know they don't make it easy on you so how can we support you for taking the time to c- come down and do this where can people find you uh, uh what what can they they do to check you out and, and how can we, we we know a little bit more absolutely yeah uh well, I mean, i'm really grateful to be here this is a super fun uh, chat and you guys are a fun group and i've been you know watching the dank hour for at least a year or two now so it's, it's really cool to kind of come full circle and be, be featured on here thank you guys again for that um, I think, you know, ultimately, like LinkedIn, you can reach out to me if anybody messages you guys about uh, the wild type rhizosphere soil, that would be super cool to check out and sequence. You know, we have a minion, uh, so we're doing Oxford nanopore sequencing for bacterial communities. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think Impello uh, is, is a young company that is kind of on its way up in the biostimulant space. Um, so if you guys need to learn about biology, we have a great education center that is like a blog post and videos and instructions on that. Um, yeah, so I've just got to plug in Pillow for sure, because I, I uh, wouldn't be doing the cannabis research I get to do without without working for this company. Is Tim Gordon not there anymore? Tim Gordon is still a good friend of Impello. He was our chief of staff when I was hired in uh, in 2020, and I know that we still you know circle back. I uh, took care of his dogs a couple weeks ago, but yeah, I have uh yeah i'm not sure exactly the title but yes tim is still you know in, invested in Impello and involved and you know we're good friends cool tom i said hello will do absolutely <laughs> gotta write that down because i built awesome. brain. and with that <laughs> being said <laughs> and with that being said we thank you for coming on the day on camera and we'll see you on the next episode of the day Hour. ciao everybody bye Thanks, guys. Oh, wait.